Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to pick it up in verse 4. It's where we left off last time with John the Baptist and his camel hair coat and his leather belt and his, you know, cricket diet. He's eating locusts. There's a lot going on there with his diet and his clothing choices that God wants us to think about. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Bible. And we've got John the Baptist bringing this message. He's Christ's ambassador. He's come to deliver a message. And he's on a collision course with the Pharisees and with the Sadducees who think they are really impressive to God, but they've got another thing coming. Today, you and I, we're going to leave knowing, if you track with it, that God is not playing games when it comes to bearing fruit as a follower of Christ. And perhaps more than anything, that it's not what you think about yourself that saves you, but what God thinks about you and whether or not you've been transformed in your life is bearing fruit. If you will stand one final time for the reading of God's Word, let's read together from verses 4 to 12. Now, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan, and they were baptizing, being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and don't suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That is God's word to us. You may be seated, and let's pray together now. Father, please, through the teaching and the receiving of your word, make us a humble people, fully aware that it is only your righteousness that can clothe us for salvation, that nothing we do, nothing we bring, nothing we think that we are is really impressive to you, but only faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus. I also pray that because of what we see and hear from John the Baptist, we would have understanding of what it means to genuinely repent and to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and then that we would go out to be ambassadors who are zealous for good works and eager to share the gospel and willing to be unpopular if it means standing for the truth. Thank you for all that has been going on already on this campus. We praise you and give you all the glory and the credit uh, for first hour with the equip class on forgiveness. Thank you for Rod's diligence to study, prepare, and teach, for the people and the testimonies that uh, we're already hearing about folks who uh, feel a sense of, of healing and clarity in their heart, whether that be bitterness and hurt from the past or just a, uh, an ignorant understanding of what it means to be a forgiving person. I pray that you would strengthen our church to be a light for your glory here and now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to unpack this text under three particular headings. The first will be the separation, and we'll take a look at what it means that John is out in the wilderness baptizing people, and why he dresses the way he does and eats the way he does. The second heading is going to be the accusation because John brings a very aggressive indictment, strong words to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
And the third heading will be the explanation because we've got to understand what does it mean to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, which he says Jesus will do, and baptized by fire. That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to baptize with the Spirit and fire. And then what is this winnowing fork that he's using? And what's going on on the threshing floor and with wheat and a barn and all of these kind of metaphorical pictures? John explains all of that, and he ties it to wrath. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means as well. Let's look first at the separation the separation. In verses 4 through 6, we begin, now John himself has a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And Jerusalem is going out to him, all Judea, the district around the Jordan, they're being baptized. All this is happening. There's a buzz out in the wilderness. But first, I want to touch briefly on his choice of clothing and of food. Nearly all commentators agree that this type of behavior is synonymous with a prophetic voice who has been separated out to serve the Lord, and he's a picture or a visual of separation in that regard, a life lived in the world but differently than the world. Also, his dress and his choice of food are an indictment to the selfish, prideful, arrogant religious leaders at the time. He's a minimalist. He dresses in simple ways. He eats simple food. They, the leaders of Israel, were pompous in their dress. They enjoyed the finest foods. They saw their position as above all the people, meant to benefit off the backs of all the people instead of serving them. And what's wonderfully fascinating is in 2 Kings 1 verse 8, we read about Elijah dressing the same way. That's why some of the people, when they come to ask John who he is, say, are you Elijah? Because they've heard about and read about and know about the way Elijah used to dress. He was out there like a crazy man too, in his camel coat and his leather belt, eating the the crickets, just giant ones that you might see in your backyard, only three times as large. Well, because this is a prophet. He stands boldly lives boldly, and he looks as bold as he speaks. One commentator says, John's purpose was not to turn the people into hermits or ascetics, meaning he didn't go out to the desert and dress this way and eat this way and say, all of you need to come out here and do it just like I am. No. He called Noah, not even his disciples, to live or dress as he did. But his manner of living was a dramatic reminder of the many loves and pleasures that keep people from exchanging their own way for God's. John is a picture of what it means to focus solely on Christ and not really worry about the riches and the cares of this world. Does that mean that you can't have nice things or you can't enjoy your life? No, but what he is is a picture of someone who would forsake all. And by the way, Paul the Apostle says the same thing. He says, I have it all, done it all, I know it all. I've been a a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I've been, uh, as to a Pharisee, uh, an expert on the law. I knew it all. And yet, I would count all things as what? He says, rubbish compared to knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Christ is my ultimate treasure. He is the one who fills my cup if you will. John is modeling the same thing. I love what Spurgeon says, though, here. He says of John the Baptist in this text, he was rough and stern like Elijah. He cared nothing of luxuries. The plainest of food is best for body and mind and spirit, and moreover, it fosters manliness, Spurgeon says. And then he applies it to his own life. He says, Lord, Let not my meat or drink or garments hinder me in thy work. There it is. It's not that you can't have stuff. It's that the stuff can't have you. What are you living for? How are you living? And are there things in your life that keep you from more effective means of service unto Christ? If no, press on, friend. If yes, be willing to forsake it if it would ever get in the way of your ministry unto Christ. 
This is the way John the Baptist was. He had separated himself, not as a legalist and, and kind of a, an, a, an early version of a fundamentalist, you know, in the holy huddle and he can never be anywhere. No, but simply to say, I have a job to do. I know why I'm here and I'm not going to let anything distract me from accomplishing my purpose. You can apply that to your life and I can as well, just in our own unique way. In verses 5 and 6, all Jerusalem is going out to him, all Judea, all the district around the Jordan. They're being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. You need to picture people are going out, they're flocking to him in droves, and they're expecting a Messiah, and John's message is quite provocative. They're going out there, and there's this crazy man who eats, you know, carnivore diet, but it's bugs only, but some wild honey mixed in, and he's shouting to them, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's going to draw a crowd. But there are these tender hearts that are resulting. As people begin to realize, I am a sinner. I need to prepare my way, my heart for the Messiah. How I've been living, the way I've been living is not his way. And when he comes, I want to be ready. And so they're being baptized in a way that prepares the heart and the mind. It's really a picture of cleansing and preparation. It's a baptism of repentance, meaning they're being immersed in the water, not to get saved or, or some work that now justifies them, but as a picture of, I, I am cleansed, I am purified, I am ready for the Messiah. I'm sorry for the way I've been rebellious against God. I repent, which simple word just means I change my mind. I change the direction. I want to go God's way. And what's interesting about this baptism, we don't know a ton about it. John's baptism is entirely unique. It's not like we've got, you know, a, a, an example of this in the Old Testament extensively. Even in the New Testament, when they're talking about baptism as the Holy Spirit is falling on people in a good way, and they're getting baptized, and he's pouring out on all flesh, and they come to these men and think, right, you've been baptized? They go, we know about John's baptism. And you remember Apollos, he's very eloquent, he's teaching and preaching, and Priscilla and Aquila, this husband-wife duo, they come alongside their brother and they say, hey, your baptism message, it's a little off. We've moved past John's baptism. There's like actual baptism. And Apollos is sharpened by that. This idea of John's baptism is, is right here. It's a picture of purification and preparation and separation unto God to prepare for the Messiah's coming. In Judaism, you have some ceremonial washing of hands and head and feet. I remember once I have a, a friend who's a, an Orthodox Jew. He's a lawyer, and he lives in Beverly Hills. And so one time I went to dinner with him at a restaurant that, you know, I, I really don't ever find myself at. But when you're hanging out with a Jewish lawyer, you go to the restaurant that he picks. Uh, a beautiful restaurant, high-end restaurant. But the main reason we were there, it's a kosher restaurant. He is an Orthodox Jew. I was looking at things on the menu, and the idea of adding cheese to certain things would get you not just looked at, but run out of there. Certain things don't mix in kosher diets. And outside the restrooms are these outside washing stations for ceremonial washing. Even today, modern-day Orthodox Jews practice these type of ceremonious washings. There's that, but even this is different. It's a full immersion into the Jordan River. People saying, I confess, I repent, I've been rebellious, and I want to look to God for my salvation. Luke 116 summarizes this saying, He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. That is John the Baptist's mission. And this separation is to consecrate a people unto God. Like many people today, the Jews had assumed their entrance into the kingdom. And people do that today. They think, well, who, who I am, or what I've done, or I'm a good person, or I grew up in church, or I this, or I this, or I that. They think that paves the way into the kingdom. Not so. When you come to the narrow gate to enter the kingdom of God, you, you don't bring your housewarming gift. You best have empty hands. You bring nothing. You take his righteousness by faith, simple, humble, in trust. And unfortunately, not everybody likes that message especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so as John encounters them, it's a little bit like a, an old Western shootout. It's a standoff 
out in the desert, but instead of bullets, John fires at them with the truth. And so we have number two, the accusation. Listen to this indictment. In verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And that last phrase, it's got a little edge to it. Like, who told you to come and get right with the God you have been rebelling against and regarding his people who you've been abusing? When did this click for you? Very strong approach. The text says they come for baptism. We don't know much more. Maybe some meant business with God. It's possible. Maybe others, since they were so known for their outward show, thought, hey, now that there's this many people, I mean, it's the majority of folks that are going out there, to maintain our high religious status with the people, we might do well to at least go and entertain this dunking in the Jordan, kind of show off some spirituality so we don't lose credibility because, man, John is really influencing the crowd. There, there may be those people that after everyone has jumped onto the bandwagon, they think, well, we should get on so we don't get left behind. An outward show, is it genuine humility? Whatever the case, John's reception is not warm. Why? Who were these men? Let me explain briefly. First, the Pharisees. Their name means separate ones or separated ones. They were the religious elites, very involved in mainstream Jewish life. They knew the law and they added to the law man-centered ideas to oppress the people and to take advantage of them. They were very showy and self-righteous. They were the premier hypocrites known for doing the opposite of what they would tell people to do and not even doing at all what they would say is law for people to do. And they thought they were above everyone else, so much so that uh, history tells us many of them would ceremonially wash themselves after being in a crowd of common Jewish people because they didn't want their spiritually elite status to be contaminated by such spiritual peasantry. They needed to get the germs off of them. Imagine today, you know, after the service, I, I can be around you a little bit in here. There's a lot of people, though, just like common folk. And so I need to go to my green room where I have a dish with, you know, only the green M&Ms. And I've got my Fiji water. Nothing wrong with Fiji water, but if, you know, they bring you Dasani, you throw a fit. You know, pastors is divas. The Pharisees were that way. The common people are far below us. We're the elite in the ivory tower. The Sadducees were more exclusive and a less religious group. They were a kind of aristocratic bunch. They're rich. You could view them today as very politically motivated, uh, liberal types that have woven their way into life and influence. Why do I say liberal? Because the Sadducees were not believers in the spirit realm, angels, the resurrection. And so they're very anti, actually, religion. They would be like those who deconstruct faith today and grow a large following. They love power. They're self-serving. They're rich. They're pragmatists. And it's helpful to discern the difference between the two because if you're like me, I don't know if you grew up in church and maybe ever sang the song about wanting to be a sheep. Anybody remember that song or it was just my weird childhood? It's a good song. But you'd sing uh, what you don't want to be and what you do want to be. I'll sing it for you. You'd sing... You know, I don't want to be a Pharisee. Anyone, yeah? No? I don't want to be a Pharisee because they're not fair, you see. I just want to be a sheep. Ba 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, yeah, some of you are all like, what in the world? Yeah, don't you make fun of my, it was my weird Pentecostal upbringing, and you leave that alone right now. I, 
I've heard they sang it in some Baptist churches too. Yes, amen. <laughs> I want to be a sheep, the Pharisees. So you got category one, but then you'd sing another verse of the song, and it was, I don't want to be a Sadducee. I don't want to be a Sadducee because they're so sad, you see. I just want to be a sheep. Yep. The weirdest one was, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be because they're not hip with it. I just want to be a sheep. Ooh. I believe the, the cool kids today call that cringe, right? Am I relating to you, student ministry? Cringe. Pastor, cringe. Okay, it's cringe. So what we do is we go Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious guys on The Chosen. They all got the robes and the weird stuff and the Hollywood Jesus movies. They're, like the, they're just wearing different colors. But they're all kind of those religious leaders. No, they're not. Two groups of influential individuals within society who are wreaking havoc on Jesus and his disciples and the followers of Yahweh who declare a message of repentance, whether it's the prideful, self-entitled religious leaders who say, we're the sons of Abraham. You telling us that we've got to do this, do you know who you're talking to? Or it's these liberal aristocrats who will have nothing to do with God and his authority. They're pragmatists. You're getting it from all sides. John goes head on at them. He calls them a brood of vipers. It means offspring of serpents. You can think maybe of John 8, when Jesus calls the Pharisees. You are just like your father, the devil. He calls them children of the devil. Strong language. Why? You are the offspring of the one who breeds lies. You're poisonous, just like Satan. Also, maybe you take the metaphor a little further and think these vipers, what do vipers do? They lie in a camouflage. You can't really tell. You see them and you're not really sure that it's there. And then they strike in a moment and it's a mortal wound. And that could be the picture as well as they are religious and they look so spiritual and yet they are poisonous religious leaders and liberal elites. He says, there's a raft coming. You obviously know, someone must have warned you, that God's judgment on sin will be with fire. There'll be a condemnation. All who reject him, all who pollute his will, all who scorn his son, God is not playing around. He brings a strong message that they must turn from their wicked ways or face God's justice. And he says in verse 8, therefore, so because there's wrath and because God is just and because he is going to deal with sin, therefore, there's this great line, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't suppose you can say to yourself, oh, we have Abraham as our father. We're fine. I say to you, from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, the same sovereign God who chose you and called you and made you his own, don't get too comfortable and too presumptuous that you can do whatever you want and think you can be saved. The same God who did that with you, oh, he can send you into the fires of hell. He could condemn you. He could move his favor off of you, and he could pull these stones and say, become children of Abraham and just choose to do it all over again. Don't you dare presume on God. And isn't that such an indictment? Entitlement can erupt in all of us, can't it? And we begin to treat the grace of God like kind of this cheap throwaway coupon, or, or we begin to treat his ways as like an option. Well, I'll try a little bit of that, but I've got to also do me. No, all of this makes it clear that when you have truly repented and changed your mind, you are going to bear fruit. That's the evidence of God's work in your life and transformation of the heart. And based on what Scripture teaches and what we know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we can consider at least four habitual patterns here together that develop in someone who has genuinely changed their mind in true repentance. I think it's an important question that you and I would say, how do I know if I've genuinely repented? I see him indicting them. I want to look in the mirror. Do I bear fruit in keeping with repentance? The first one that you will see in a genuinely repentant heart that has been transformed is humility instead of pride. This is the call to them. It certainly is the call to us. The fruits of repentance 
are going to lead you to a place of humility, not pride. In fact, you'll begin to hate pride and yours in particular, just like God does. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 17, if you've never heard that God hates, you should read Proverbs chapter 6 later on and look because this chapter helps us understand there are six things which God hates, and then the author says, yes, even seven which are an abomination unto the Lord, and begins to make the list. And the first one is haughty eyes, H-A-U-G-H-T-Y, haughty, meaning prideful eyes, that we think we're something. God hates that, friends. Why? Because it makes more of us than of Him. It elevates ourselves and not Him. Proverbs 8, 13 says, the fear of the Lord... Certainly, that'll be evident in the transformed, repentant heart. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, meaning I don't want it. I don't love it. I don't rejoice in it. I don't think it's funny or awesome. I hate it. I don't want evil near me. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. He's quoting the Lord. This is what God despises. Why? Well, look at them all. They all elevate man. They all damage relationships. They all blacken and destroy your heart as it becomes an idol factory of worship unto yourself. And humility would say, it's all about God. Psalm 18, 27 is good news. The psalmist declares, for you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. God is in the business of bringing down the arrogant and saving the humble. Self-righteous Arrogant hypocrites who repent, become contrite, humble, poor in spirit, no longer spiritually arrogant. That is fruit that the root has changed. It starts in the heart, and it will come out of your life. Number two, faith instead of works. This would be an indictment on the Pharisees because they thought their works were really impressive to God. To bear fruit in keeping with a change of mind, the Pharisees, who were notoriously works-based, ought to trust in faith to justify them for salvation, not their righteous deeds. You and I need to do the same. You and I, let's just throw away our impressive resume when it comes to trying to earn God's favor. You are loved because He has loved you. You are saved because He has saved you. I am going to preach that from now until my dying breath because that is essentially the gospel, justification by faith alone. Stop thinking your works are doing something to make God shower down the atoning blessings of salvation. He saves you because of his son. Now, he may bless you or favor you or open doors because of your obedience, but you also may suffer. People with cancer who are obedient are suffering, going through trials. Are they bad? No. And yet, there are times in life where God may bless your obedience. What's the point? Is you never try to turn anything into a presumptuous formula. Like if I do good, then everything's going to go good. Or if I do bad, everything's going to do bad. God is so gracious to some of us, amen, who haven't been living the way we ought to. And you, you, you're basically shocked by his grace. And it erupts within you this, this desire to follow because you think, I, I really should have been vaporized by now. Okay, I'm listening. You're so kind. Better than I deserve. But others, you're getting prideful. Everything's going great in your life, and you think it's because you're really impressing God. Yes, obedience can lead to blessing, but be careful presuming what all those blessings will be. Just focus on obeying Him. Why? Because you love Him. This is faith. Third, thanksgiving instead of entitlement. The Pharisees were so entitled... That he tells them, the same sovereign God who chose you, saved you, and made you his own could raise up children of Abraham from stones. Don't think you're something incredible. Just be thankful that God is. I had a coach once who used to always say, it's hard to be thankful for what you feel entitled to. One of my favorite quotes. If I haven't said it five times already, you'll hear it now. I keep repeating that to myself and to you with our team. Why? Because we should just be a very thankful people. I don't ever wake up and want to presume on God's grace. I want to be thankful. 
You and I, our identity as beloved, chosen, called, redeemed, gifted, blessed, favored, and empowered. It's not because of you, not because of me, but only because of him. So we should be a very thankful people in the midst of being humble, having faith, and being thankful. We also then would see in the fruits of repentance, holiness instead of worldliness. This desire for holiness increasing. The fruits of repentance include a desire to live set apart from the ways of this world, even though you and I are in the world. And look, holiness has fallen on hard times in the church today. People will call the exhortation to holiness legalism. It's legalistic. It's not. We're called to be holy. So many Christians will treat holiness and the command for it, kind of like a, a buffet, you know, they, they put a little bit on their plate and then they go, well, but these other things as well. But when your heart changes, the root will produce genuine fruit and that fruit will be the desire to be holy because God is holy. You want to follow him. In 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16, Peter says, as obedient children... Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. It's like you didn't know. There was a time in your life when you just did these things. Okay, but now as obedient children, as the people who follow Christ, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. What is he saying? He's saying your actions do matter. Don't discard those and swing to the other extreme into well, God sees my heart and, you know, you're all just legalists and if you call for holiness and obedience, you know, you need to lighten up now. It's all grace. Yes, and grace transforms. This is what he's calling for. You shall be holy as I am holy. What does it mean? You shall be separate in your conduct, in the way you make decisions, in the way that you live, in the way that you dress, in the way that you talk, in the way that you plan. Just your whole life is not taken with the cookie cutter of the world and shaped by it, but rather the stencil or the shape of Scripture in which your holy God calls for, and that's what presses in. And anything that has to go, you don't care why, because you're chasing after His pleasure. That's all you want. What does God want me to do? What is He calling me to do? How does He want me to live? And I, I don't know if there's a more important question for you and I than to ask. Am I bearing fruit in keeping with repentance? Are these four things growing evident more in your life? Not perfection, but progression. Do you care more about these things than you ever have? Am I humble under God's authority or am I prideful? Do I think my works are really impressive to God? Am I thankful for sovereign mercy towards a sinner like me or am I entitled and I take grace for granted? As you spend time showing love and caring for the world around you by sharing the truth, just like Jesus did. Are you influencing them, or are they influencing you? Do you hold convictions without compromise in the midst of showing compassion? Or have you bought into this slow fade and this idea that in order to reach the world, I've got to have more tolerance and acceptance for the world, and therefore, I I need to alter my strategy or... You simply trust the Lord and live faithful according to his will. You let the Holy Spirit convict you. I certainly want to as well as I think through these things and ask, am I guilty of calling things legalism because I'm actually just convicted and I'm uncomfortable with calls for greater attention to holiness in my life? Maybe, just maybe, the people who shout, Pharisee, Pharisee, legalist, Pharisee, are actually the Pharisees. Maybe we're all a little more Pharisaic than we thought we were. What do I mean by that? The Pharisees were playing by their own rules, just like people do today. The Pharisees were the ones who got angry and reacted when they were told, repent. The Pharisees were the ones who got very irate when they were told, Be humble, be holy, stop what you're doing, and turn back 
to God's way. You are his shepherds and you've been unfaithful. They reacted with such aggression. Is that not today so many who, to your invitation to follow Christ and to turn from their ways, to the word repent, to the words obey, be holy, follow Christ, cease from that and turn to this, trade that way for this way, to that they will say, oh, you're such a Pharisee. God loves me just the way I am. Friends, you and I don't make the rules. God does. We don't set the definitions. God does. The problem for the Pharisees was they were hypocrites and masters of fakery. And the Messiah coming was going to destroy their pompous little kingdom. William Perkins, the great Puritan, said, Godly sorrow causes grief for sin because it is sin. What does that mean? Well, it means that if they were coming for that baptism and to do anything but be humble because they were sinning, it was all filthiness to God, impure motives to put on a show, even to avoid hell. I want to tell this to you guys who are here. You think, well, I, I don't want to go to hell. That's really the reason I want to believe in God. No. Get that out of your head. Is hell real? Yes. Is that the final condemnation and the judgment for those who reject Christ? Yes. But the reason to stop sinning and loving it and to stop living your way and to live for Christ is not so you can get a get-out-of-jail-free ticket, but to love Christ. The reason to address sin is because sin itself while it leads to death, is an issue now, not just then. It's an offense to a holy God. And if you love Jesus, then what offends him offends you. Perkins said that godly sorrow in a man will make him say, if there were no conscience to accuse me, no devil to terrify me, no judge to condemn me, no hell to torment me, I would still be humbled and brought to my knees for my sin because my sin has offended a loving, merciful, and long-suffering God. This is the way that the repentant person views their sin. Do you? When you think about your sin, is it excuses? Well, if they wouldn't have, then I wouldn't have. Or you just don't understand the struggle, brother. Yes, I do. We all do. James says we all stumble in many different ways. Welcome to a room full of sinners. The question is, are we a room full of humble sinners who are recognizing our need for Christ? It's not about stop doing bad things. It's about loving God so much that you no longer take pleasure in what he hates. They had not, and the seriousness of it is eternal. And so we have finally the explanation. He says, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's a metaphor that he often used in the Old Testament. They would have known it right away. The picture is from Isaiah 10. It says this, look, the Lord God of the armies will chop off the branches with terrifying power and the tall trees will be cut down. The high trees fell. He's clearing the thickets of the forest with an ax and Lebanon with its majesty will fall. He's saying God's justice is going to swing like an ax. And this isn't pruning, it's purging. See, pruning is a good thing. When you and I are pruned, God is chiseling away at us. And what happens to bushes when you trim them down and you prune them properly? They grow more explosively. I've got this tree that at some point is going to ruin my driveway because every time I trim it, it just gets more zeal to grow even bigger for the next year. That's good. This, oh, this is purging. God's not playing around with them. They've been playing around with him, thinking there's something when they're not. He's saying every person who doesn't bear good fruit will be sent to hell, eternal fire. And the only way to bear good fruit is to genuinely repent of your sin. And the only evidence that your fruit is actually real is if you have repented of your sin and God has changed your heart. And so he does that, which is the root, and that will change your life and your actions, which is the fruit. But this is a threat. It is. We need that in our preaching today and in the church. We can't be afraid to say Listen, this is all or nothing. The ax is at the root. 
I think so many times we kind of want to try to get everybody in. Just doing our best to, to do a little renovation on the narrow gate. Just widen it a little more and try to usher the crowd in from different angles and make Jesus more tolerant and more palatable, make it a little easier. No, it's repent and bear fruit in keeping with repentance or you will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And then he finishes, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. He's saying, look, this baptism has been about preparing yourselves for the one to come. It doesn't save you. The one who's coming is the one I'm preparing you for. He's mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to put his sandal on his foot. And when he comes, what's he going to do? He says he's going to baptize you in the spirit and with fire. There's two things that result when Jesus comes. It's a ministry that divides down the middle. There will be those who he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is the outpouring of Joel 2, baptizing people into the body of Christ. He is saving them. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit. You got the gift of the Holy Spirit and his power working through you. And then there will be those he will immerse, baptize, baptizo in the fire of judgment. He's preparing them. It's almost easier with John is really what he's saying. Guys, I'm just the setup man. Consider this the grace of God. He's almost here. Are you ready? Are you humble? Are you sorry? Will you look to him for salvation? I hope you will. There'll be only one of two outcomes. You're either going to experience his spirit or you're going to experience his judgment. And what's the final picture there? The winnowing fork. The threshing floor in those days when they would gather the wheat would have these large winnowing forks. You could kind of think of this even in modern farm terms, maybe with a a pitchfork or a type of tool like that. You can picture all the wheat piled and the chaff, it's there. And what the, the harvester would do is take his winnowing fork and he would throw up the wheat into the air. And chaff is light. When it doesn't have any grains of wheat on it, it's light. And the wind, that breeze, would just blow it off the threshing floor. And what would fall and remain is that which had wheat, a little heavier. It would drop. And he would do that again and again and again until all you were left with was the pure grain, the wheat that could be used. This is exactly what Jesus is doing. And it's such a powerful illustration of how the church is today. If you'll preach the truth, live the truth, stand on the truth, you know what God will do? He'll build his church. He'll take that winnowing fork and he'll sift the wheat every single Sunday. He'll do it through the truth of the word. He'll do it through your witness in the workplace. He'll do it everywhere you go as ambassadors. And what he's doing is he's making it clear who belongs to him, who has the humble heart. Who has come willing and repentant and eager for his righteousness and who is blowing in the winds of this world? It's not only one of the most painful things that we experience as pastors, but also the most peaceful thing. Why? Because it's not my message, it's not my scriptures, it's not my church, and they're not my people. We all belong to him and he's doing his work. So what else would you do but go out there and let the truth fly? Trust Jesus with the results. That's what John did. And the good news is that God's love for you is seen in the gospel and in the offer. And the fact that you're still breathing right now, by the way. And that today could be the day of salvation for many or the reminder for many of us to be humble in light of his mercy to us. As he gathers you into his barn And you never have to experience the fear of the unquenchable fire of judgment. And the worst outcome of all, by the way, separation from our holy, loving, merciful God for all of eternity, the one who created us. We're the imago Dei. We're in his image. And our whole purpose is to live this life, to glorify him, and then enjoy him forever in eternity. This is the greatest joy and the greatest outcome. John is calling Israel to come home humble. God is not to be trifled with, but if you would come, as Israel was called, to come humble, in repentance, to be cleansed, he will welcome us with open arms, like the prodigal experienced when he finally gave up 
his rebellion, and he turned from his ways and his worldly wickedness, and he came home, and his father was ready and waiting and willing. The father did not go out to him. He did not go to the pigsty. He didn't go to his brothel. He didn't come with a little housewarming gift and say, hey, I'm just here with you, man. No, he waited at home, praying, pleading, weeping for him, and when the prodigal returned with that humble, repentant heart, that father pulled up his tunic, which is an embarrassment to a Jewish man, showing those white legs that ain't seen the sun for years years, and he sprints down the driveway. That is an embarrassment to the Jews at that time. He says, slaughter the fattened ox. Give him a ring. Put my royal robes on him. Why? Because the prodigal has returned. This is the message you bring. That is love laced with truth this week. For you, for me, that's how we live. Why? Because he's gathering his wheat into the barn, and he's sifting out all who would reject such a beautiful and gracious offer.